Music and politics, two completely different things. Music, that's something we all enjoy. <laughs> we love to hear it. Sometimes we sing along to it. It makes us feel like dancing. And many of us love to make music. Politics, well, that's a different story. Nobody wants to hear it. Who sings it in the shower? You certainly can't dance to it. And most of us want nothing to do with it. So, two completely different things. Music, whether it's rock or hip-hop or classical or jazz, it's got melody, it's got harmony, it's got rhythm, and just sounds and feels so good to us. Well, politics, the debate, discussion, and process by which we make policy decisions and govern ourselves as a people, well, we don't want that in our earbuds. Aside from the fact that both music and politics permeate and affect our lives every single day, they seem to have little in common. However, I believe there actually are intriguing similarities between music and politics. And by tuning into those similarities, we could compose a better politics and brighten our world with the music of dialogue. Now I came up with this idea because I'm a composer and a former Chicago punk rocker who was elected mayor of a Utah town that was bitterly divided and polarized by its politics. Springdale, Utah, the gateway to Zion National Park. A beautiful town. Picture it. The Virgin River flowing through a magnificent Red Rock Canyon, 3,000 feet high. The glide of a red-tailed hawk the sweet song of a canyon wren, quiet, peaceful, paradise. But when I moved there, the county sheriff came to town meetings to keep fistfights from breaking out. <laughs> the mayor and the council sued each other, nearly bankrupting the town. Somebody got so mad at the mayor, they threw a dead chicken onto his lawn. <laughs> so, I did what any punk rocker would do. I dove headfirst into that mosh pit and ran for mayor. <laughs> Thank you. But the surprising thing was that over the next eight years, the things I loved about music helped me tune into the controversies I faced as mayor. It started when I went house to house, knocking on doors for my first election. Folks invited me into their living rooms, and we sat down together. But I didn't really talk so much as listen. I asked, what are your concerns? How do you feel about the town? What do you think the town needs right now? And I listened, because I felt if I was elected, I would know my town much better and could serve it better. Well, this is the same approach, the same way of engaging that I take with every band I'm in, whether it's rock, folk, or classical, especially if I'm the band leader, because music is all about collaboration, and collaboration is all about listening. Do you know the one thing that never happens at a public hearing? You never have a public that's hearing. I got that from a book by Daniel Chemis, who inspired my political thinking. We come to advocate our point of view. We don't put the same effort into hearing the other points of view, so we don't take responsibility for coming to an agreement. To solve our problems, we need to turn toward each other and listen. Like musicians do, like we all do when we listen to music. We hear the different voices, the bass line, the drums, the guitar, the harmony, the counterpoint. Whether it's music or politics, when we actively listen, we stay together. And we have better ideas, like jazz musicians. They're a great example of this. Why, they're up there having a musical conversation in real time, and they improvise their ideas on the spot. But they don't do that in a vacuum. They know that to play a great solo, 
You've got to listen to the whole band if you ever expect to say something. That's from a book by Ingrid Monson, a jazz scholar. And we could take that advice when we go to a public hearing or any kind of meeting. We could say to ourselves, I'm going to listen to the whole band before I say something. Because when we speak from a foundation based upon true listening, when we really get what's going on in that music or that discussion, then when it's our turn to take a solo, we can really fly like Miles Davis or John Coltrane. And we will add something new and valuable to the conversation. I finally remember the night before my election, after walking all day, going house to house from one end of the town to the other, I was tired and I was hungry. So I was grateful when, on my very last visit, a sweet elderly couple, Larkin and Ruth Gifford, invited me into their home for a sandwich and a glass of milk. <laughs> then Larkin pulled out his harmonica and handed me a guitar. I listened to his tunes, figured out how to accompany him, and we played some old-time songs together. Now, I was still a newcomer, so making music with a long-time resident of the town? I felt so welcome, so at home. The next day, I was elected, and over the following months and years, the whole town became my band. We jammed together, and I listened to every one of them. But more important, I asked them to listen to each other, and they did. And we collaborated like a good jazz or a bluegrass band. And through our active listening, we solved our problems and healed the town. But of course, politics continued. It always does. We still had issues to discuss and resolve. But you know what happened? As I conducted those meetings, I began to hear certain themes and patterns that resembled musical form. One meeting could be like a blues song, another like a classical sonata. For example, I remember one town meeting when a developer proposed that we change our zoning to let him build a large commercial building in a quiet residential area. That sounded to me like... <laughs> Then another citizen rose to respond, and he said, please don't change that zoning. Keep our green space as it is. That sounded like... <laughs> Now, I just played the two contrasting themes from Beethoven's Fifth, where they get argued back and forth, just like the two contrasting themes in our town meeting. That's the sonata form, often used by classical composers as a way of organizing and presenting their ideas. First, there's a main theme. Then there's a contrasting second theme. Then there's this long section where those themes get explored in greater detail, heard from different angles, reconsidered, rephrased, sometimes transformed. That's exactly what happens in town meetings. That's the music of dialogue, of political debate. Now, staying with that zoning issue, let's tune in to the sound of common ground. There were folks in town who agreed with the developer and thought we should al allow his building. Let's take three of them and represent them with these three notes. Now, these folks agreed with each other, so when you put them together, they harmonize, like this. That's the sound of agreement of people with similar views. But there were other folks who loved our green space and didn't want that building. Let's take three of them and give them these three notes. 
they too harmonized like this. That's also the sound of agreement. But what happens when we put those two groups or those two chords together? That's the sound of disagreement. But are there really any wrong notes there? Does one group have to change its views, change its tune to coexist with the other? Or can we find a way to accommodate those differences? In music, that's the sound of polytonality. Many different keys or chords all at once. In politics, that's the sound of pluralism, of people with different interests, values, and traditions living together in one society. And there's something very interesting in this pluralistic chord that helps us find agreement within those differences. It's this note. And what's interesting about this note is that it has a place in both chords. The developer chord, the green space chord. And if we put that note on top, we can hear it even better. It sings. When we listen for it, we can hear it. Now, when I was mayor, I really listened for notes like that. Notes that can smooth the differences between conflicting opinions. And on this zoning issue, I heard that note. Its name was Stephen Roth. Stephen was a builder in town, so he had a place in the development chord. There's Stephen. <laughs> he harmonized with their views. But Stephen was also an artist, so he shared some perspectives with the green space chord. And there he is again. He harmonized with both groups. When we listen for it, we can easily hear it. And we can hear that note even better if we put it at the bottom, underneath those chords. It provides a foundation, a home for different people different opinions, and that's the sound of common ground. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's what I tried to do as mayor. Find that sound, turn it up until everyone could hear it. Then whenever we needed to, we could tune back into it. And no matter how far we may have strayed, we could come back home to our common ground. So those are three ways we could think about politics musically. Listen to the whole band, hear the music of dialogue, tune in to the sound of common ground. Music is a lens through which I see the world. Each of you has your own lens, your own unique perspective, that the world needs to hear. When I came to Utah, I heard a wonderful story about, a wonderful Navajo story about the song dog. The song dog, a coyote who sang the whole world into existence. Just like that, just found its voice and sang. I love that story. We all have that power and capability. Be that coyote. Find your voice and sing. Compose your own song. And together, we can sing a politics of possibility and create a brighter future. We're not only citizens of this world. We're composers of it. I'm fascinated by how we compose our lives and our communities. When we come home to our common ground, when we hear the music of our shared dialogue, 
when we listen to each other's songs and sing our own, then we are collaboratively composing a better world. And to that brave new musical world that we sing into existence together, we can rightly say, Bravo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sing your song. Thank you.